Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our town hall uh, for this week. We um, uh, look forward to these opportunities to be able to engage with you. Um, and uh, we're, we're hoping that as you have questions, uh, you'll engage us as you have in the past by um, using the chat function um, on your on your screen. We do have quite a bit to cover today, um, including um, the latest uh, uh, information we have on uh, our response as a system of higher education to COVID. Uh, we'll have uh, some conversation about um, the new board um, and a new commissioner of higher education um, that has been announced uh, today. Uh, we'll also um, again have uh, some updates for you on our short term training and initiative um, as it relates to the program that we were um, um, kind of rolling out last last time. Um, athletics uh, will have um, we'll, we'll cover what we know at this point on athletic competitions and then also on the budget. We know more now about where uh, where the legislature has come down on on the budget. But it's my uh, real pleasure, a distinct pleasure to welcome a friend and a guest uh, of Snow College, um, Spencer Jenkins, uh, who is the chief of staff for the commissioner of higher education and really a very, very effective um, colleague as it relates to external relations for the system. He um, largely coordinates the legislative efforts for each of the uh, eight Yushi institutions and and I'd be interested in kind of knowing at some point uh, Spencer what your duties how, how they change with the new structure with um, you know with all of the tech colleges joining but um, the the primary reason that we've invited Spencer to join us uh, this morning is uh, he has the uh, uh, the honor or the unfortune of being designated really as the system lead in coordinating with health officials at the state level, uh, coordinating and sharing a state task force on on COVID as it relates to higher education. And uh, and, and uh, he's been very, very good at, um, at very nimbly and, uh, you know, uh, competently um, dancing and adjusting to a very, very fast environment. So Spencer, it's nice to have you uh, with us uh, here in Badger Nation. And uh, why don't you tell us a little about yourself and, and uh, what what occupies uh, most of your time <laughs> other than COVID? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, President, thank you. Uh, I, I, um, I appreciate being able to be a part of this. Um, I was thinking last night as Marcy Larson was um, giving me a little bit of a lead up to things that I'm kind of bummed I can't make the drive to Ephraim. One of my favorite things is kind of cresting over that hill into Fountain Green there in the morning and so uh it looks like it's a beautiful morning morning just judge on some of the windows i'm seeing so uh think of me as you go walk outside and enjoy the temperature i guess later today <laughs> um but president thank you um i i work at the commissioner's office here in salt lake city uh it's kind of a big day here uh as of today technically the two systems that oversee higher education this public higher education in the state uh, the Utah system of higher education and then the technical college system are officially now the same system. And as of this morning, the board met in their inaugural meeting as a new board, adopted new bylaws and uh, appointed a permanent commissioner, uh, Commissioner Wilson, who's been the interim commissioner for the last year or so. Um, with that, there will be some changes uh, uh, organizationally, but also kind of how the system and the board function. And hopefully at the end of the day, they're good uh, changes, um, a little more clarity and and efficiency, I guess, uh, from the state level, uh, but hopefully also really allowing the institutions to flourish in their in their respective roles. Um, president Cook, nothing but great things to say about uh, the president. Um, I've known him for several years in a lot of different capacities as we've moved different ways, and it's cool now to see him at the helm of one of our institutions. Um, and so as for myself, I've been in the commissioner's office uh, for almost, uh, I'll, I'll be hitting 10 years this summer actually just dawned on me. 
Um, I'm more of a political hack than I am anything. Um, my a lot of my work is spent on legislative relations um, at the state and federal level. Um, as Josh knows, and before that, Rick Wheeler um, worked closely with the institution folks in coordinating the legislative efforts for higher ed in the state. Um, but with that, also I've been tasked with things that come along uh, on an as needed basis, I guess. So um, as part of that, I've been asked by the commissioner to sort of um, shepherd the COVID-19 um, efforts across the institutions. And uh, I, I would not profess to be an expert in this area. It's uh, uh, fast evolving for all of us. Um, it's been a very fascinating road the last few months. Um, as President Cook can attest, he's been in many of these meetings, many as you know, as many as 30, 40 people on a on a web conference like this, from athletic directors to attorneys to provosts to HR directors, trying to make the best and sort out all of the information that's swirling around um, the coronavirus efforts. Um, from the system perspective in the first part of June, we felt like it'd be important to get kind of a general set of guardrails or guidelines out for the institutions to at least start um, kind of creating a guide path for the institutions as they plan uh, their, especially for their fall semesters. And this plan was very broad um, and it, we put out what we call gating conditions. And I'm not gonna go through all the gating conditions that we uh, published, but uh, it, it really hinges quite heavily on the information around the pandemic itself, whether it's uh, the pre prevalence of the disease, um, the uh, infrastructure around contact tracing, uh, obviously testing is a big question, but also uh, trying to get to the bottom of what should higher education institutions specifically be considering as we look at this fall semester. Um, to me, I think what's been most striking is uh, assuming most of us on this on this uh, web conference are faculty and staff, uh, we're here because we are interested in being a part of students' lives and impacting them. And we're all very aware of the limitations that virtual interaction have versus in-person experiences have for students. And I think we're all motivated by hopefully the goal of getting students back to our campus in some form or fashion, knowing it's not going to be totally the same, just knowing what we've seen the last few months. However, I think what we're all trying to work towards is sort of a complete back to online 100%. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I applaud people like President Cook and others who are trying to find this balance between making it the best experience for students faculty and staff, but also knowing there are some real safety uh, precautions and 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 uh, risks that we have to consider out there. Um, and so that's been really the conversations we've had from week to week as a task force across the system of sort of the leads on this coronavirus effort at the institutions is trying to find that balance. The hard thing is it's a shifting balance as as we all are very aware as we I think we all wake up and here at the headlines, um, this sort of second wave has caught, it's alarming public health uh, leaders in the state. And you'll, you're starting to see headlines about, do we have capacity? Is it stressing the, the system? And obviously it's very regionalized as well. Um, what we see here in the Salt Lake Valley and pockets of the Salt Lake Valley look a lot different than what we see in San Pete Valley and in Washington County or Cache County. And I think thankfully, Part of that is we're getting a growing awareness of how we manage things on a more local level. And so I don't foresee us uh, dealing with what we saw in March in this sort of blunt uh, reaction. Um, I was in a meeting yesterday with Dr. Good, who's the president of uh, University of Utah Health Sciences. And he even acknowledged that um, from a healthcare standpoint, they took extreme precautions and they don't envision doing that going into the fall. For example, you know, all uh, elective procedures at, at healthcare facilities and hospitals were shut down for several weeks in the early spring and that had a significant impact on healthcare. Uh, they saw that that was probably taken too far. Um, so I, th I do think we're learning things, but we're also 
watching very closely what the next few weeks hold and we're watching the trends nationally and so these next three to four weeks really are critical um with that president I'm, i'll be happy to take president, questions I, I don't want to get too far into things i think there's probably some discussion that people may want to have um, spencer unless... can you uh can you hear me yes yes okay we're just uh, we have a little bit of a glitch on our end uh, can you see us I can see some moving and others not, but I can hear you great. Okay, and, and I'm assuming that our audience can uh, hear us too. What about the staff that are online? Um, say, Carson, can you hear us or see us? Yep, I can hear you just fine. Okay, well, we're just gonna go ahead and continue on with, uh, with the audio as we work on uh, the video here. I wanna, again, welcome those that have just joined us. Um, to that This morning, we have a guest, uh, Spencer Jenkins, who is the Chief of Staff at the Commissioner's Office um, of uh, Higher Education. Uh, and Spencer has uh, just been updating us on some of the state um, uh, sort of um, uh, strategies is about how we kind of move into this, uh, this, uh, this next fall semester. And um, so um, one of the things that we have worked on here, as uh, the audience knows, is we have an emergency operations committee, an EOC committee, which we meet weekly, and that includes all of our kind of senior administrators, as well as our uh, chief of police, and a whole variety of folks who are, are um, analyzing our current condition in the county um, and our ability to respond to a variety of scenarios. Um, I just want to check, make sure we're still okay on the audio. Uh, you're all sort of frozen there video wise, but at least we have some video. Uh, Spencer, can you acknowledge? Yep, I can hear you great. Okay, all right, we'll just continue uh, continue on. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, so, so you, you may want to maybe tell us a little bit about um, the, the latest on, on this because um, as we're planning, we're actually trying to prepare for multiple scenarios. And that scenario we hope, um, as you know, is, is that we'd love to be able to have openness uh, and be open. Um, we're planning on that with, uh, with a very sort of robust safety protocol um, when that happens. But we also know that the cases of uh, COVID are escalating uh, in Utah and in different states. Uh, and so if we were to uh, have to shift to a, an orange or red, we have that um, in place as well. But, um, but I found these conversations with our state health officials very, very interesting mm -hmm. that even the specialists are trying to get their head wrapped around, um, you know, just exactly uh, the, you know, how this, uh, this, this, uh, um, how COVID is, is, is transmitted. Uh, mm -hmm. what is effective and what isn't, um, what we've learned over the last few months. Any, uh, any insights, Spencer, things that have struck you about this very dynamic situation? Yeah, I'll, I'll certainly try to add some color to it, and I don't want to speak too much on this, but it, it truly has been fascinating. The last three weeks especially, um, from our perspective early on, our thinking as we were looking across the country was, well, in order for us to be ready for this fall, we need to be very scaled up on testing. We need to do whatever testing we can as a way to sort of preemptively measure and mitigate any uh, hot spots or, or, or outbreaks. And, uh, you know, that was the thinking. But as we get into the details of what's required for testing, we're learning that's a very expensive, be very unreliable and C, it's only a snapshot in time. And we're learning more and more from our public health officials that this virus moves and moves in, in the sense that it's very contagious. And so if you're to test someone, say, at the beginning of the semester that's going to live in your residence halls, it could be two weeks later that that, that student is exposed. Um, and so it's kind of it's interesting because the thinking has really shifted away from well, we need to do mass testing preemptively to well, we need to do things upstream to mitigate the spread. And so, you know, obviously we've learned about a lot of the, the preventative measures like sanitizing stations, masks, um, be happy to talk through the politics related to masks, but those sorts of things, social distancing. But with that, this contact tracing idea too, or, or 
concept or, or undertaking is also in a big, big conversation because obviously the way to track down the spread of this is through contact tracing. But even in the conversations about contact tracing with our local health departments and with the institutions, even that is still unfolding in exactly how we do it and do it, do it effectively. Just as a couple of examples um, from one of our institutions this week, they, uh, a person described how they had a student who was in close contact with a faculty member. They were exhibiting signs, so they sent them off to get a test. And meanwhile, two faculty members and the student are self-quarantining until they get results, even to get the test back. From there then, there may even be further downstream impact to that. So what it's leading to is all kinds of conversation and discussion about how do we do this in a way it, 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 it scale as students start coming back to our campuses in the fall. And I don't want to suggest things too drastic at this point. I think it's premature. But I think one of the big things we have to be very mindful of is I think we're all going to have to be pretty flexible in seeing how these things play out in the next few weeks. Um, but, but President, you're exactly right. It's been a fast moving conversation and week to week at this point hearing from public health officials and others about kind of the context and scenarios that they're seeing both nationally and kind of from a public health standpoint. Well, we do know that, that some things we know do matter. Um, we do know that distancing matters. We do know that masks make a difference. We do know that hand sanitizers uh, makes a difference. And because of that, the governor came out with an executive order yesterday. Do you want to talk a little bit about that as it relates to state Yep. Uh, institutions and state buildings. Yes. Um, so yeah, the, the executive order I think was announced last week, but the details of it came out yesterday. Um, but it does include, I mean, we're public institutions, we're state institutions, and so within state facilities, masks are required under his executive order. Now there are some exceptions. Um, specific to activities like people that are either uh, in athletics, especially indoor athletics facilities, there are some exceptions there, but of course, there are still some expected protocols to be taken. Um, but I would say, generally speaking, the governor is kind of setting that expectation for all of us on state facilities that masks should be worn in places where social distancing is not uh, is not able to happen. So those of you sitting in offices, I think you're in a good place right now, but as you uh, navigate campus and move through the hallways and other common areas, that's where masks are meant to uh, be worn. And uh, in some ways, it's kind of nice because, you know, President, you know these conversations we've had and you've all probably seen sort of the politics around masks. But at the same time, I think there's strong enough emerging science around what they do, at least in group settings and what they help in, around this coronavirus, around this pandemic. So, so the campus is, is preparing um, for a, uh, uh, a regular sort of face-to-face -face opening. Uh, we are in the process of uh, purchasing um, a lot of equipment to make sure that our employees and our students are safe, including plexiglass, uh, plexiglass barriers, um, additional uh, hand sanitizer, additional gloves and, and masks. Um, but it might be worth just um, sort of also outlining some of the, uh, the early plans that if uh, students do come on campus, the plan as of now, and it may it may have to shift, but we essentially would create for both staff and faculty and students really a 24 hour pre-screening process. Now this is not perfect, but um, but we do feel here that we do need to have some pre-screening uh, so that we can at least uh, get uh, sort of a, a barrier between those that might uh, that might be sick and from from those that that aren't. So the the sort of general idea is is that we're actually now in plans of of uh, of, of more than a dozen stations around campus at key entry points into buildings. Now, um, the hope is, is that we aren't going to create some backlog there when students are coming, trying to come into class. So we're going to make very clear that they need to come early and spread out um, and, um, and that there are multiple stations across campus where they will um, have two pre-screening tests. One would be an infrared temperature test just to see how uh, whether their temperature is elevated. 
and then they would have to ans answer uh, just a, a couple of questions about their general health. Um, if they if that uh, seems to pass, they would then be given a specific colored band around their wrist for the 24 hours, and that will allow um, them to be on campus. Um, and they would also make sure at that station have a mask. If they don't have their own mask, we will provide a mask for them. Um, but as they come into classrooms, then they have to have a mask as well as that that band so that we can protect other students uh, uh, in there. Now, what we, uh, we we if we happen to sort of find someone who has an elevated temperature, um, that we would then essentially uh, move them to another uh, room where we would actually take a second temperature test, probably through the ear or even uh, a, an oral thermometer to sort of make sure we're we're checking because sometimes these infrared tests, let's say that you're running to the to the door because you're late for class, you may have an elevated temperature just from that. We want to make sure that we aren't getting false positives. Um, if uh, we determine that this uh, this person is um, maybe uh, flagged, we will then uh, essentially uh, have them go back and isolate in place of where they are. We will then uh, we've, so we'll organize then what we're calling COVID care teams. That COVID care team will be made up of staff and faculty that are trained that will reach out then to that particular student to, to make sure several things happen. One is that we move towards getting then an actual nasal swab test, uh, make sure they have transportation down to the clinic, uh, make sure that they are emotionally supported, uh, make sure that while they're isolating in place that they have the academic support, whether there's a laptop that they need, uh, making sure that they have the food that they need to be supportive. Um, once the test is as uh, is, is results come back and it, it's no less than two days, so they're two days, they have to two days or, or three, we should get then a positive or negative reading on that. Now, if they uh, test positive, we will essentially then have a quarantine section in Nuttall Hall uh, where they will be there until their parents can come and collect them. Uh, we work very closely with our, our county health officials to make sure that we aren't transporting people around the state um, recklessly. So we will want to make sure that uh, that they will be cleared to maybe go home and recover uh, wherever their home might be. But we have a lot of students, as you know, they're non-residents and international students. They would remain for 14 days um, in Nuttall Hall. Those COVID care teams would continue to make sure that they're supported um, physically, emotionally, and, and, and academically. Now, uh, that is still a very imperfect uh, science, but we know that if we're making sure that people are uh, have masks, that they're social distancing, uh, that we're doing the pre-screening, um, I, I think we uh, have put in place, um, you know, uh, um, a process in which I think we can be fairly confident uh, that we can respond appropriately. And, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, as we look here, I'm looking at some questions uh, that might be coming up. Um, one question is, will you require or request all faculty and staff to get tested before fall semester? Um, I, I don't know whether we, uh, we can require everybody to get tested. We probably encourage it. Um, and making sure that we have enough tests uh, available with our local our local county, but um, um, but we certainly are going to require masks uh, of everyone and to uh, make sure that if you have any symptoms, right, any symptoms at all, uh, be a good citizen. Um, you know, make sure that you're you you stay at home. We're trying to be as flexible as we can with everybody uh, to be able to work from home when and where. Uh, possible. So one of the other questions, if a student is suspect, sus suspected of being sick and unable to go into class, will the instructors be willing to work with them to do their work online? And the, and the answer is a resounding yes. And one, one of the great things about our faculty is they understand the dynamic situation that our students are, are in and our faculty are in, and we will work uh, with those students well, we're also putting in cameras and, and maybe we'll have uh, 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 Carson Howell and Melanie talk a little bit about we're trying to 
to uh, have all of our uh, all of our classrooms equipped with um, with really kind of state of the art cameras and microphones so that that students who uh, might have a have question about their health can stay in their dorm and uh, but continue to take on their uh, to take on their studies. So Carson, Mellon, you want to just add a little bit of what we're planning on doing with this to help make sure um, that our faculty are protected, but that the uh, the instruction remains available in multiple ways for um, uh, for our students. Melanie. Sure. Hi, President. I'm happy to talk about cameras. We, not all of our classrooms will have cameras, but the most used classrooms will have cameras. And um, that will allow students, if they're sick at home or they're unable to come to class, they can log in synchronously and participate in class from a remote site, or it will tape the lecture or discussion and then the student can look at it later. So students will have access to the material uh, right at the same time that it's happening in class and they'll have access to it later, which is a best practice for um, students anyway. And so we're, we're excited about this option. We'll ha we have 100 cameras coming in. We've asked the deans to give us the classrooms that will best utilize that resource and we'll get those in as quickly as we can. Uh, any uh, any addition there, Carson? Sure, I'll just say that uh, that the way that we're being able to do that is that COVID money, the CARES Act funding that we received, um, the the 1.2 million that the that Snow College received in order for that transition to online. So we're using a large portion of that in order to equip all the classrooms, and and I think that'll be a great thing that uh, that will benefit us not just this semester as we try and transition, but moving forward. So we're really excited about that one. Yeah. Great. Uh, one of the questions, just to clarify, as of now, are the masks required for all of the fall classes for both students and faculty? And the answer is yes, that when you're in a classroom or a lab situation, masks uh, will be required and they will be required. Um, really, if you can't, if we can't somehow stay away from six feet from each other, uh, we, we need to make sure. So the combination of the masks and the colored bands which would have would have probably about uh, seven different colors, sort of indicating that for that 24 hour period um, that they uh, they are cleared. Um, so, but what that does is that once they get a check in the uh, at the station, then they'll be able to sort of be able to move about the 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 campus uh, pretty freely. As it relates to masks, we do have uh, an important caveat, though. There are some that have conditions, um, respiratory conditions, physical conditions where masks um, uh, uh, really create another challenge for them. So um, we will have to be very flexible with those that may have a respiratory condition that that uh, precludes them from having that mask. Um, the question I guess now is if students choose not to wear a mask, then what are our options? So um, one th what we want to make sure that um, that as students enter in the classroom, unless they have those two things, they're not to be they're not to, to come inside. But we're also making sure that we take a lot of the pressure off the faculty at these stations, right? The staff and, and students that we man in these stations We'll, um, we'll make sure that we're emphasizing uh, that message so that uh, faculty don't have to be the heavy enforcers. Uh, we're hoping again that with social pressure and with, uh, you know, with this uh, sort of heavy expectations, a lot of people would just self-regulate and, uh, and comply. But, um, so, so anyway, I hope that kind of gets to uh, that question. Um, are masks required when you are in your office alone? And, and maybe I can uh, pitch this to, to Spencer. I, um, the, the, I think the short answer is no, as long as uh, you're not sharing a, a space. But uh, how, how would you come down on that question, Spencer? Yeah, you, I think you just answered it right there. And, and I would just add to what you were talking about with masks. I, I think the general feel, and especially this kind of the social message is, hopefully we can all sort of treat the situation with respect. I mean, we know if there's going to be 
I'm sure there'll be people out there either refuse to wear a mask or for other reasons are not able to wear a mask. And I think hopefully people will kind of be respectful of these this sort of new way of going about our campus life. But you're right, this, to specific in offices, um, as long as there's distance, um, it's not a shared office, then you should be just fine. We were actually um, also investigating um, some technology uh, that um, will we'll be able to use with some of our students and their phones and our staff and faculty in helping kind of maintaining um, sort of uh, uh, sort of a, a uh, help us again one more tool to give us a sense of where students and faculty might be in terms of their their health. So we're investigating technology where we can. Um, we've looked at all kinds of scenarios. We actually think that the physical manifestation of the band matters um, just because otherwise, if we're just trying to rely on our phones as uh, you know, that you might be cleared on your phone, there's, it's not physically evident that 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 you've essentially cleared some of those those um, you know those those uh, those minimum requirements. Um, let's see what else we have here as it relates to um, what about offices that have plexiglass? Are masks still required? It's a good question. Um, I'm not sure I have exactly an answer for that, but my guess is probably will both for your own you, you know that. Uh, uh, my my get my answer would be yes, especially if the if the governor's executive order stays, uh, then that's I think a very clear answer. If it kind of reverts back to a yellow, um, I, I think we probably have to have supervisors make sure that we're looking at each situation that uh, wherever this staff member is is placed uh, in relation to other colleagues that might be next to them, we we may or may not. Uh, have to have masks, but uh, any any other insight on that from the EOC folks, or, or even Spencer? Do you have uh, how would you answer that question? Uh, so, President, I'll I'll take a, a stab at that one. the The governor's executive order. Um, this is Carson. The governor's executive order talked about cubicles and and areas that, as long as um, they reach the top of the head while you're sitting down. If you're enclosed on three sides, then then you do not need to wear a mask. And so, if the plexiglass covers that area um, for for the employee, then they would not be required to wear a mask under the governor's executive order. So I think that we just need to look at the the office space. Is it um, is it accessible to other people? Um, are would other people be in? I, I guess in in danger of of uh, contracting COVID in that that situation, and then if if the answer is yes, then we would require a mask um, in those circumstances. I, I want to welcome those that have joined us. We've had a few uh, since the last introduction. I want to um, um, uh, welcome our guest uh, Spencer Spencer Jenkins, who comes to us from the uh, commissioner's office who has um, been assigned to really help lead um, the uh, presidents and, and other entities across the system uh, with our COVID response. And uh, I really appreciate his, uh, uh, his, his, his even handedness here, his steadiness. And uh, so he's with us today to, um, to give us a perspective from, uh, from the state. Uh, some other questions here. Uh, do the scarves do scarves work as face coverings? Uh, would they count? Um, anybody want to take a stab at that? Yep. As far as we can tell, they count. I mean, there's all kinds of different masks we see out there, but it's a fabric face covering is basically what the the mask definition is. I think. Yeah, and, and to remind us all that really, again, the face mask wearing isn't so much a protective barrier for yourself. It is really more of a protective barrier for those around you. So it really it is a really one of these interesting situations about, um, you know, being mindful of each other. And uh, so so I, I know that you probably have read a lot of things about the, the effectiveness of masks, um, but what we do know is that it really does matter 
for us in terms of transmitting um, the virus from ourselves. The uh, barrier coming in is less um, less helpful. That, that really isn't a very effective barrier for yourself. But if we all wear them, we're going to be in a much better situation um, on campus. Uh, one of the other question uh, from one of our faculty members is if I'm giving a lecture, uh, can I take my mask off so that the students can see my mouth as I speak uh, to better understand what I'm saying? Um, if there's plenty of distance between me and the students. So um, any any reaction there? I'm, I'm sure it is really about the distancing that matters. Um, and uh, making sure that we're we're, we're making sure that uh, that maybe even that first row or two might we might not want to have students. We may have to sort of cordon those off. But yeah, any thoughts on that question? So it's a it's a good question. So I, I, I think your advice is good and it, it, it highlights just just to clarify a couple things. The governor's executive order is only a two week order and now we anticipated extending, um, but I think it highlights the sort of transitory nature of all this. Um, we're talking about plexiglass and masks and two, three weeks ago, four weeks ago, the conversation was slightly different and so it could evolve is, is I think an, an important thing to keep in the back of our minds that by the time we get to late August, some of these protocols may shift a little bit. Yeah, if there's anything we know uh, in our experience over the last several months is is uh, <laughs> uh, this is the most dynamic, fluid experience I've ever seen. And uh, so uh, back to some questions. Uh, somebody asked us about clarifying the bands, so the the, the wristbands. Um, we, we may have a different system as we as we move into this, but right now the EOC is proposing that uh, every 24 hours, all of us essentially go through a pre-screening, uh, and then they will get, once you sort of pass a, a infrared test uh, temperature screen and can and can answer uh, some questions, then you'll be given a a, a colored wristband that essentially says for the next 24 hours uh, you're um, free from COVID as far as we know and uh, those would change every 24 hours and uh, we're putting together um, a whole kind of small army of, of, of students and staff to create a dozen or more stations throughout campus that one could get that wristband so that they can then move on through the campus through the, through, through the rest of the day. I, I hope that, uh, that that clarifies that, but we're we're, uh, we're sort of uh, making sure that we're we're keeping all of our options open. The primary thing is to keep us as safe as possible. But I think it's really important to, to understate uh, or underscore rather that we are not in a position um, to eradicate this disease. It is here. It's among us. Uh, it's about managing um, our risks. And uh, we will have cases, um, uh, uh, assuredly, and, uh, and and that as long as we have a ways in which we can then identify, quarantine, and get people help, uh, we can minimize um, um, all those risks. But we also know that we we may have to, given the situation, we may end up having to do a hard shift back to remote learning. We don't want that to happen. And right now that is not what we are uh, planning on, but I think we need to be prepared for um, all those scenarios. And uh, that is an unfortunate thing as a leader to tell you is let's just <laughs> stay, stay. Uh, I wish we had more definitive um, uh, understanding of where this is all gonna be in late August and September and October, which are also, um, what we know is was likely to be with the cooler weather to be to provide some resurgence risks. Um, let's see, one of the other questions is. Um, how is the checking of students and wristbands being handled on the Richfield campus? So there will be stations there as well. The instructions to, to faculty um, will be that students will be asked to not come into class if they don't have both a mask and a band. Um, 
if someone takes up for some reason, if someone's being belligerent, uh, they will. Uh, we, we just essentially will not start the class um, with someone that may be presenting a risk. So they will be moved if there is a need for uh, We hope this doesn't happen. A need for physical removal we will have some folks trained um, at the uh, stations to be able to come in and help escort um, bad actors out. We just don't think that's going to happen, but you just never know. We want to make sure that the faculty, though, um, aren't uh, we want to minimize their enforcement uh, duties. You've got enough on your plate, um, but uh, we, we need to be prepared for those that that may want to make a statement or something. I don't know. Um, but uh, Richfield will essentially have really the same protocols, but just on a kind of on a uh, on a smaller scale. Is the ban for staff and faculty as well as students? And the answer is yes. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, we are modeling well for our students this uh, this practice, but it's just also uh, we're we're part of a community uh, that is in this boat together. Um, <clears throat> so we need to 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 do that as well. Will you be advising students to not go home on the weekend so they don't bring the virus down here? We will be advising our students to do this, but to the extent that we can control it and, and seal the doors, it's just not going to be possible. Uh, we're going to explain as clearly as we can uh, that it is movement around the state, bringing it back, that creates a huge risk for us all. Um, but uh, but we know that's not going to be 100% um, effective, uh, which relates to this question of what do we do about about Thanksgiving, um, you know, do we essentially go online after Thanksgiving? And right now we're still, um, we're actually planning on having students come back after Thanksgiving. Uh, we may have to change that, but but our rationale in the EOC is people are going to be leaving, coming and going from campus anyway, every weekend. So to assume that a lot of our students are going to be here on campus, stay put and only then go home on, on Thanksgiving to come back, um, uh, the, that 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 uh, that genie is already out of the bag probably every weekend and so we just have to sort of now now if we have non residents we may provide an opportunity for them to be able to leave before Christmas and then then uh, and then be able to plug in uh, online we want to provide that opportunity so especially if the people are leaving for to go home and they may be um, in um, in uh, COVID hotspots uh, around around the country. Uh, anybody else want to weigh in on on this? I, I'd like to bring our our athletic director in, uh, Rob Nielsen. Um, many of you have had questions about how we're handling athletics. We are essentially going to be on a beta test testing the station and the daily testing with uh, athletes that are coming in. Uh, for a soccer camp and also for pre-camp for football. So Rob, you want to talk a little bit about um, the protocols in place with this group that will be able to maybe pressure test it, but also maybe give some comments about uh, what, how to, how, what do competitions look like coming uh, into the fall? Okay, thanks, President. The NJCAA has, has given us pretty much responsibility to determine how each region and conference are going to handle athletics for this year. As a region, we met with our presidents and athletic directors the first part of this week and decided that we wanted to do as, as much as we could, maintaining as many protocols as we can to make our athletes as safe as we can when we travel and when others travel here. So we're putting uh, protocols in place to get that ready. And then as president mentioned, on July 6th, we'll have about 120 football players come for a summer class so they'll be here on campus, they'll enroll, they'll be in housing, they'll be eating food services, and they'll be in class and doing some workouts so that we can put all the protocols in place, not just for athletes, but to try and understand how this is gonna work for all of our students. So each of those athletes will be tested each morning uh, before they uh, go, go onto the field or go any place. Then we'll follow the things as President mentioned, if someone has a temperature, we'll isolate them retest them throughout the day, and then if needed, they will go get tests. If they do have, uh, while we're waiting for the test, we'll put them in Nuttall Hall, which is for isolation purposes. 
once we get the test back, then we'll decide how we handle it from there. Uh, we'll have the care team practicing how they'll be staying in touch with them, providing meals for them. And uh, so we should, after a couple of weeks, understand a lot of a lot of the questions that I see are really good questions. And, and as we put all this together, these are things we need to know because it's hard to see every everything that's going to happen. And as uh, people have mentioned, we need to be very uh, flexible and uh, get ready for our first game is the end of August. So we are looking at how we'll do fans and what will be spectators and how we'll do social distancing and things like that. So we're planning on a, a season for all of our sports. Uh, volleyball and soccer will be coming on August 1st. So we'll have those people to test as well and to kind of get ready for the student body as a whole at the uh, end of August. If there are questions you have for, for Rob, please um, uh, please let us know and we can get to them before we end here. But I, I also want to respect the time of our guest, uh, Spencer Jenkins. Spencer, you're uh, a terrific colleague. Uh, thank you so much for, for joining us this morning. And uh, any any final words uh, from you? And then we can go on to, th to some other topics like our budget um, and like our short-term training initiative. Yeah, um, I'll just say in conclusion, I think this is, as we kind of started out, and you mentioned this, President, this is unlike most of what any of us have experienced before. What I think is really going to be the most fascinating, and this is not just for higher ed, but for public ed, trying to do this this fall, I think we have those of us that work in the field, but also the people that want to be students, both in public ed and higher ed, I think we want to make this work. And I think what will be really fascinating, and I'm ex this is what kind of excites me, is I think we'll make it work. And that's kind of, I, I hope we can kind of shoot for that, knowing we need to keep everyone safe. We need to make sure we're keeping an eye on things. But at the same time, the idea that education can help kind of move the needle, what I think is kind of an exciting component to this, if I can editorialize a little bit, you know, we're all, we've been isolated, we see these things swirling around us around the world and in the headlines. To me, the education platform is the place where this stuff gets discussed. The public square that is education is a way in which we kind of get these things out in the open. And I, and I feel like that's gonna be a huge mechanism in helping us as a society get ourselves around this pandemic and get used to what the new normal is. So I, I'm all in there on kind of this, I guess, Pollyanna utopian statement, but I do think it's, a big part of what this fall entails, both for K-12 and higher ed, frankly. Well, thank you. I actually share those sentiments. Um, I believe uh, I believe in us. I believe in in our people. Um, and it's these are this is a wicked problem. But um, but but I really do think that that uh, higher education is a has a really important role in solving this wicked problem. And uh, and we're not there yet. We have a long ways to go, but I really do believe that we um, we can get through this. Um, and uh, thank you, Spencer, so much for all you do for us. And uh, we'll let you get back to uh, which is likely a very, yeah. very busy. No, thank you. Thanks. And, and good luck to everybody. Thanks for all you're doing. All right. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. Um, there are a couple other questions that have come up uh, on the COVID planning, and uh, let's uh, let's get to those for a second. And then I'd like to actually um, bring Carson back in on uh, what we know now from the state legislature on the budget situation. Uh, but one of the uh, questions was if a, if a student had a condition that didn't allow them to wear a mask, um, my recommendation at this point, and there may be some other ways to think about this, is that we probably wouldn't allow them to come into class. What we do is is, a, is create a way in which they can um, take advantage of the education through uh, a laptop or technology. Um, I, I just think it's uh, it would be very hard to um, to give those kind of exceptions, and then uh, they're. You know, they they're, they're essentially could be a, they, they could be a carrier themselves. So um, we, we may want to look at that as an EOC, but but my sense is is that if they can't wear a mask, then we just find uh, accommodations for them to take um, take classes um, through the through their computer. Um, we were we'll we'll start to sort of publishing um, a little bit more detail, especially maybe a flow 
chart uh, that we've been putting together. Uh, thanks, Marcy and, and Wayne and others as to a decision tree as it relates to this pre-screening. Um, you know, there was a question about, you know, because we uh, we start as staff and faculty sometimes earlier than the students, in some cases, some uh, staff and faculty would start as early as 6 a.m. Uh, we would find we would have uh, maybe limited numbers of stations available even at that uh, stage of the of the morning uh, and, and then creating more um, more stations, especially when we get into the 9, 10, 11 o'clock area. What we don't want to do is is create long lines. Uh, that just is again a breeding space for uh, the 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 virus. So um, uh, we will for those that are early uh, that have early shifts or are early risers. Um, we'll have instructions in terms of how you might be able to do the pre-screening and then get on get on with your day. Um, so listen, if we uh, you keep the questions coming, uh, we'll plan on about another 20 minutes to 30 minutes if, if uh, we still have uh, interest. But I, I think you may be uh, um, wanting to understand where we are now with the uh, state budget. Um, and what the decision has been from the Executive Appropriations Committee as as it relates to the budget reductions for higher education. So um, Carson, would you mind um, maybe updating the campus on where we are with that and what are some of our preliminary plans to identify those cuts? Yeah, sure, President. So about two weeks ago, the legislative session, the special session happened and the legislature decided that they would cut about two and a half percent from from all the institutions uh, from state agencies. And so for Snow College, that equates to seven hundred forty thousand, uh, about seven hundred and forty thousand dollars that we would need to reduce from our budget. Um, in addition, and, and President, you've talked about this before, um, because enrollments have have historically not come in where we needed them to. Um, there was also a little bit of a hole there that we needed to fill and that's about a million dollars. So all in all, we're looking at about uh, about 1.7 million uh, that we would need to cover. Now, however, uh, the legislature did pass a few things and, and provided some funding. So uh, things like uh, the medical premiums, they, they funded those, which is about a quarter of a million dollars that, that would have hit Snow College. Now they did take off the compensation piece um, and and that part, so the two and a half percent compensation that that we had originally thought that we were getting that they had appropriated uh, earlier on in the year, that was taken off the table. But one of the things that they also funded for Snow College was four hundred thousand dollars for career technical education. So uh, for enhancing and promoting career technical education CTE programs. So that's something that is currently being discussed of how those funds are going to be used. Um, and, and so as we, we look at covering both the, the hole that we need to fill and then this, this $740,000 uh, clawback from the legislature, there, there are a number of things that we've looked at and that we've talked about. So we've looked at, at some administrative restructuring um, we've also looked at, at keeping some of the positions, the faculty and staff positions that are open right now, uh, freezing those and, and uh, looking for ways to, to accomplish those tasks with existing faculty. So, um, so those are the things that, uh, the, the tactics that we're using to cover that. Now, um, in addition to, to just the 740,000, we actually had a little over seven hundred thousand dollars in in required needs that uh, we needed to fund this year, and so those were things like contract inflation, um, contracts that we've signed that we need to pay for. We are we've included um, the faculty advancement and tenure portion on there. We've included the um, advancement for for degrees and things on there for faculty and staff. And so some of those things are, are costs that we need to cover. And so that that gap that we need to to cover um, and that whole uh, the whole and also the clawback, 
those are things that it's kind of a moving target as we look at all the different things that we need to cover um, and and uh, how we're going to do that. But those are the, the main ways to do that. There will be some some uh, some one time savings that we're going to use. We're going to look at some rollover savings. It's very likely that uh, that there will be some some uh, current expense budget that we ask uh, departments and, and divisions to to reduce your current expense budget um, while some of that may be one time and we'll look at those one time rollover savings we're also asking that some of that be some ongoing uh, cuts and so that may be uh, you know in the five to ten percent range um, for a current expense cut uh, but then we would ask for a portion of that to be to be ongoing since these cuts and the holes are are ongoing things that that we need to cover. So that will be coming coming out and we'll be working with uh, with faculty and staff and, and the campus as a whole to discuss ways that we can can cover those. But at least for the 740,000, which we need to report back to the legislature, um, that will be, those are through the restructuring and the holding positions open that, that uh, we are, we need to report back to them on. Yeah, and just to remind, I, I think the campus that the guiding principles that we've been trying to maintain with with this this budget exercise is uh, again what we're calling the three P's, and that is that we are essentially preserving our mission. That that's a key priority, protecting our people, um, and also then promoting ways in which we have other revenue streams that we can we can foster. So we have uh, multiple ways in which we can continue to, to grow um, uh, our, our budget. Uh, I'm really happy to say that we um, we are going to be able to protect people's financial positions. We, we aren't going to have to lay off people. Uh, we're looking first at, uh, again, you know, positions that might not be filled at the moment um, or uh, take a look at uh, you know, taking a look at some of our uh, current expense budget that might involve, you know, a five or ten percent reduction, and then allowing, you know, the units to determine where that would come from, whether that's a reduction in in travel or reduction in in hourly, but giving some lat latitude or some decision making about how you might help us find those. To the extent that we can find base cuts, the better for us. Um, but we may be able to do with a combination of base cuts as well as one time cuts. We can get there. Um, it just makes uh, yeah, this is also assuming that we're going to have flat growth. Um, we we're pretty positive that we won't be flat in growth, but we're we, we've essentially built the budget uh, with no growth um, built in with uh, with with the growth that we think we will have um that will even make the budget situation a little better and uh, terry i do want to tell us a little bit where we are uh, with our enrollment at this point in the uh, beginning of july yeah certainly so this is good news but as i say every single time we are going to take this with a grain of salt because COVID has um really turned everything on its head so we're but this is where we're sitting right now. The nice thing is that right now, year over year, from this time where we were last year, overall enrollment is up 8%, which is really fantastic. Um, the majority of our growth is in new freshmen, which we are 216 students ahead of where we were this time last year. And that's due to some really fantastic work of our admissions advisors in the admissions office, our ambassadors, and basically anyone who is out there promoting Snow College. So I'm really, really happy about that. I'm also pleased to note that we are starting to narrow the gap a bit with our continuing students. So we were very concerned about our continuing students and where they sit. And right now we're only down 47 <laughs> over where we were last year. Still a lot of work to do. Um, I. I'm also happy to say that our FAFSA filing, which is one of our indicators of how well we're going to be doing with enrollment, is continuing to increase. So we're, we're up <laughs> in our FAFSAs, but we cannot lift off of the accelerator right now. We have to be, you know, 
full steam ahead and continuing to work. Um, the admissions office is working on melt strategies, and that is basically making sure that those students who we have enrolled stay enrolled and come and show up for this fall. And so they're working on that and keeping students engaged. We're also um, very happy with all of the things that are COVID related, that our orientation will be online this year. And we're working furiously to get that into Canvas. <laughs> and which is just great because we don't want to have 1500 students congregating on the first day of class and in you know a small <laughs> environment. So we will be doing that online um, and hopefully give them access sometime in July that they can continue to be engaged, which is just another melt prevention strategy that we're going to be employing. So 8% up, we'll take it. <laughs> well, thank you. And, and and you know that we're we're keeping that uh, that pedal to the metal. In fact, do you want to talk a little bit about our call center uh, strategy that uh, there'll be multiple uses for this call strat as it's call center. But uh, do you want to talk about how that could be um, very helpful to our enrollment efforts? Yeah, so right now we are pretty much just relying on our admissions counselors or volunteers to reach out to prospective students. With the implementation of a call center, this really opens up some availability where we can be reaching out to students um, on their time frame instead of that eight to five, we might be able to reach them, you know, in the afternoons and evenings um, and mix things up. Snow is known for its personal connection with students and anytime we can make a personal connection with a phone call, with a text, anything like that is is really vital to that student staying engaged with us. So we hope to be able to use this in contacting our current students, making sure that they're registered, talking them through, you know, the many, many questions they're going to have about this fall. Um, our new students and keeping them engaged, we hope to be able to utilize them in our short term training and hopefully even down the road, maybe having them help out with, you know, reaching out to alumni for donations and other type of projects that way. So right now um, it looks like uh, we're up about 8%. Um, uh, there's a lot that can happen between now and then though. So back to the budget, um, whatever we have above 0% growth will really, really help us on, on that front. Uh, there are other things that we're uh, going to be offering um, to, to get at uh, some of this structural imbalance. And in fact, maybe bringing Josh Hales. Uh, one thing that uh, we have been um, considering is uh, providing an early retirement option for those that it might make sense for. So Josh, you want to kind of walk through those uh, uh, those details? Yeah, so most employees, uh, hopefully you guys read the policy notices I sent out to everybody. Um, if you had, uh, you'll, you'll know that uh, our uh, early retirement policy is now gives us a little bit more flexibility to um, offers a little bit more creativity in, in our early retirement programs, um, which really helps in situations like this. Um, so what we're looking to offer is for anybody whose age plus years of service is 75 or more, or any employees who are at least 60 and have at least five years of service, um, we're, we're going to be offering an, an early retirement incentive. Um, and so what that incentive is for any employees who will be under 65 at the time of retirement is yes. Um, they can uh, remain on benefits for uh, either three years or until they reach Medicare eligibility, whichever comes first. Um, and we'll also pay a stipend equal to 20% of their pay uh, again for either three years or until the employee reaches uh, full Social Security eligibility, again, whichever comes first. Um, now, that creates a problem. What about uh, employees who are over 65? Those those uh, benefits aren't, aren't really attractive to anybody who's already passed those guidelines. Uh, so what we're offering for employees who will be over 65 uh, at the time of the retirement is we'll allow them to remain on payroll uh, for one week for each year of service. So, for example, if um, 
you know, if they've been here for 10 years, uh, you know, they'll, they'll retire uh, on one day and we'll, we'll keep them on paying benefits for an additional uh, 10 weeks for 10 years of service. Uh, and we're going to cap that at, at 15 weeks. Um, so anybody who's interested in this program uh, need to let us know by September 1st uh, of this year. And anybody interested in this in this program needs to actually have the retirement date be March 1st or earlier. Um, now, any employees who wish to take early retirement outside of this window, um, we'll, we'll just negotiate those uh, like we always have under um, either the old policy, um, if they've applied before uh, this last Friday or under the new policy. So uh, so that's, that's the program. And, and I should also add the caveat that any early retirement request is going to be subject to approval by the employee's manager um, and uh, and President Cook. So um, so that that's the program. Uh, again, if you're interested, um, come into HR. Let us know. Talk to your manager, and, and we can uh, uh, get it worked out. Thank you, Josh. I think in any questions, uh, please uh, go ahead and 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 uh, indicate in the in the the, the panel there. Um, but that uh, again, that's part of the anything else though on the budget, uh, Carson, we, we plan on having uh, um, some sort of solid recommendations that we can take to the budget uh, committee. But uh, remember that this is just to summarize the two and a half percent reduction. Is, we've got to come up with uh, a seven hundred and, and forty thousand plus. Uh, but that's not the only thing we need to come up with because we've had negative growth over the last several years. There is a structural imbalance. Um, and the total amount is going to be right around 1.5, 1.7 million that we need to reduce. And we're going to meet that with a combination of, of base reductions um, as well as some one time. But I got to say, we, uh, we have to feel pretty fortunate given what COVID has done to the economy of Utah and to the country. Uh, the fact that uh, uh, the legislature only uh, went uh, as deep as two and a half percent, I think we can feel very, very fortunate. We were had plans uh, as high as 10 percent, and uh, that was very, very grim. So we're coming away with, uh, um, I think, uh, uh, a very manageable um, uh, situation, and it really doesn't impact or uh, harm the really, really the core things that we're doing. And I'm very happy to 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 uh, to report that. Carson, anything else? No, President, I think that's that's exactly right. A across the country, institutions are, are getting hit pretty hard. And and to have a two and a half percent cut and then looking at at a, a little over a million or around a million that we also need to cover that we are pretty fortunate. And and as you mentioned, um, looking at both base budget cuts and ongoing savings, uh, we're in a really good position, and I think that we're going to be able to manage through this. Uh, this is going to be a multi-year effort. Um, obviously, those one-time savings, they don't fill the hole completely, and so uh, so we'll need to come back again next year. But I think, as as you mentioned and as Terry mentioned, with growth and and we're seeing uh, some some growth, we anticipate growth for this year, and as that continues, then that just means that that ongoing hole that we need to fill gets smaller and smaller. And so we can continue to cover that with one-time savings, um, some well, some ongoing cuts here and there. But I think we are we are really in a good position. Good, thank you. If I could shift a, a conversation to Stacy McKiff, who is um, we, we welcome as um, an interim associate vice president for academic affairs, and one of the uh, very early assignments that she has is to kind of organize. Um, um, Snow College in submitting proposals for state funding for for uh, upskilling and reskilling um, those in our six county region to get them back to work uh, or provide them more opportunities. Um, so, Stacey, you want to talk about this because we've advanced quite a ways in the two weeks that we've we've known about this, and I I, I got to just really say how heartened and excited I've been 
to see as we as we put out this call for proposals the incredible reaction and response in a positive way of ideas uh, innovations um, from all over the campus um, a lot of them were faculty members some were from staff members but um, we had over 50 proposals uh, that we uh, we were reviewing so that we could get some approval from the board of trustees this last week so that we could then move forward with some of the uh, proposals to the state but stacy has been uh just artful in organizing this creating uh, a process so stacy do you want to give us an update of where we are um, at this point sure thank you president yeah so if you remember we had a couple of weeks ago dr gilmore from yushi with us talking about this whole process and as president mentioned we received over 50 proposals those ideas were innovative they were impressive and so now we're still in the process of narrowing down the large list the biggest change that's that's been that's materialized since we last met is the reduction of available funding across the system what was once 150 million dollars is now down to nine million dollars to spread across 16 institutions and so it's a more competitive process now, but, but we're really confident in the proposals that we received from all of you. So the next steps are, we'll first receive the criteria from Yushi. They said they're going to be able to provide that to us by July 6th. And then we'll match up our most viable proposals with that Yushi criteria. And then Yushi hopes to review the first set of proposals on July 20th. And so it, it will be a tight timeline. If you recall from last time, we said the money needs to be spent by January 1st, so by the end of the year, and that's a little bit challenging for us. But again, as the president said, we've been so impressed with the ingenuity and innovations that have come from our campus, and we're excited to see where this takes us. So we will, re we will send a a message out to everyone who submitted a proposal to inform you about the proposal status if your proposal is moving on to Yushi by the middle of July. So just be a little bit patient with us as we get those criteria from Yushi and then and then try to come up with the best proposals we can for Yushi's review. And then we should know by the end of July how how we came out. You, um, I hope this doesn't put you on the spot, but I'm, I'm wondering if you could give uh, our audience a bit of a flavor of s some of the programs uh, that uh, that are being proposed. Um, and uh, I think that you'll be impressed too with um, um, some very kind of concrete, concrete competency concrete. skills that really would help people get a job or uh, advance in their work. Yeah, we had a really wide range of proposals and we categorized them by, so th these are our categories that they fell into, agriculture, construction and skilled trades, technology, business and entrepreneurship, social science, arts and humanities. So we had, we had proposals from all across campus, but we, we had anything from, you know, commodity marketing to uh, concrete fundamentals of concrete to entrepreneurship to um, networking and cybersecurity, uh, wireless technologies. So, just across the board, and it was very exciting for us to see. So, we hope that even even the proposals, obviously, all fifty of them are not going to get funded by the state, and so we hope that even pieces of these can be implemented through the ingenuity that everyone has been showing with these great ideas. Yeah, and the priorities, the state seems to, to, to place a prior, priority on those programs that um, one has a very strong support from DWS, right? The Department of Workforce Services of, of, of a need there, uh, where, where proposals are also gonna get prioritized that have a relationship with an existing company. Let's say we've got a company in, in uh, Salina or uh, in Moroni or or in Nephi, uh, to the extent that we can work directly with those companies, that will essentially bump up um, on kind of the score. What other things? Uh
I mean, we're still the, the, the criteria aren't uh, fully out yet, but we have been communicating with Jess Gilmore, who's been giving us some insight as to what generally what they're going to be looking for. Do you, you want to tell us what you know about that, Stacey? Sure. Most of the money needs to go towards student funding, so that's for tuition, if it's a for credit class or any fees for the course, even equipment. And so another another proposal that came in was for drones and those drones can be used in lots of different ways. And so if a student needs to have a drone to learn how to use the technology that that can be part of the proposal as well. So all of it is all of it is based on getting people back to work in this short term time frame and and then filling jobs that are actually needed. And so I guess that's the other part of the criteria. Are there jobs open for people who would get this kind of training? So we've been working with DWS. We've talked with CTE directors. We, yesterday, the president was consulting the superintendents. And so we've been trying to get a really wide range of feedback to know what will really be best for our region. So that initiative aside, and, and uh, um, Carson did mention, one of the really uh, amazing things that happened out of this last uh, legislative uh, decision, not just the budget cuts, but we were allocated $400,000 of ongoing money for our technical education initiative. That is huge for us. No one else got that kind of uh, support and that came from our local legislators and other leaders friends we have in leadership at the at the legislature they believe in us uh, they also understand the need for this kind of training uh, technical education training uh, in our in our region and so um, one of the things i want to do immediately uh, you may have seen that we were advertising uh, a month or two ago for a vice president for technical education we put that on hold thinking that we wouldn't have the resources for that we want to make sure that we get um, good leadership uh, over that. That may require then some reorganization of, of um, uh, our programming, but what this person will do is essentially be function like, um, in a way, uh, would be Snow College's um, uh, 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 representative at these meetings with the presidents of the technical colleges. So, because that is an additional uh, resource that we will now be eligible for, not just in performance-based funding, then UCHI funding that we've, we've, we've had before, but this other set of resources that comes through the technical uh, college um, uh, grain uh, 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 channel there. So um, we're very, very excited about this. Uh, the superintendents are, are ecstatic that we'll be able to expand more technical education offerings uh, throughout our, our region. I'm excited that we can do more for our adult learners that may uh, that may need this kind of training as well, with an emphasis on stackable credentials, micro credentials that we can then lead into an associate's degree, and uh, and and maybe um, uh, uh, the four-year degrees that we have. Um, so uh, I was just telling the group before we started, um, I've been invited to uh, to be a uh, speaker on a national platform explaining Snow College's uh, really two-tier model where we have the, our academic Snow College uh, efforts and then also our Snow Tech or our technical education piece that is under one umbrella. And why that why that is important is it's unique because we essentially then can make sure that students are articulating, right? If they start out with a non-credit certificate, uh, and then they want to continue on that they can bring with them uh, those that those competencies and that uh, uh, it translate into credit, which then they can layer into something uh, larger. Uh, that is not unique. I'm sorry, that is unique uh, um, in, in the country. Uh, in addition to our third prong, which is really our accelerated online learning platform, uh, it really is a, a very dynamic and uh, triangulated approach to enrollment and servicing as many students and different types of students that are necessary that that are that we we serve throughout the uh, our region and throughout the state and eventually throughout rural rural America and other disadvantaged populations. 
Um, listen, we're coming down around the uh, 90 minute mark here, 1125. Um, I'd like to, to, to ask if there are any final questions that you might have uh, as it relates to anything we've talked about today. I would like to be thinking about whether there are guests that you'd like to hear from. Uh, it was very exciting for San Pete County last night to to uh, uh, watch and see uh, Spencer Cox uh, uh, kind of be ahead in the uh, in the polls in the Republican primary last night. We do have a, a couple of days before it's finalized, but it's looking very good. And to be able to have a governor who is an alum, uh, a governor who understands rural Utah and Snow College, is a, a terrific a terrific thing. Uh, my wife Jan and I uh, were in Moroni last night. They had a, a big function uh, there in uh, uh, with all appropriate spacing, of course, um, at the drive-in where the the lieutenant governor and uh, Senator uh, 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 Senator Deidre Henderson uh, were there along with um, all the support. Oh, sorry, it was Mount Pleasant, not Moroni. Uh, apologies. Um, at the drive-in, and it was a very festive uh, environment, and to see um, that Lieutenant Governor Cox um, be ahead in this way, I, I think is uh, is very exciting. But if there are are people that you want to hear, and I'm sure that with enough time, we could actually hit, have him come on uh, and speak to us if that's of interest. Um, are there any other kind of leaders uh, around the state that could uh, could uh, give us insight that you? Um, uh, are interested in. Um, we are very, very open to this. Uh, we will start having more regular uh, um, town halls uh, of open fora once we start school, but we will continue the every two weeks until then. Um, we have uh, really pretty good attendance still. Um, it's uh, It means that you're engaged, uh, that you're interested, and uh, if there's any way, again, we can continue to communicate better. Uh, remember that we're all available um, online through email, phone calls. Um, come and see us uh, as long as you have a face mask on. Uh, but we uh, we uh, we're here to serve you um, to, um, to 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 help you be successful uh, in your in your work. Um, is there anything else? Uh, I'd like maybe Melanie Jenkins um, being our kind of interim provost, um, some of the things that are planned coming up for our faculty, especially as it relates to training. Do you want to remind uh, some of the, the faculty um, of those training events coming up? I sure do. I was hoping that we would get back to that question. Um, we have a, an online training seminar scheduled for July. This is for faculty who have not taught online before and who are interested in expanding their repertoire and, and being able to teach with best practices in the online environment. And we have several faculty signed up for that in July. We're also going to offer uh, an upgrade online um, session later in July. For those of you who already have been teaching online, we're working on a new template. We're working on some new um, guidelines on getting classes through, and we're going to invite some of you to participate in that. Chase is putting together uh, a series of webinars on remote learning and what we learned in our quick uh, pivot in the spring, and he's going to call some people in who did very well with that pivot and have them share some ideas about how remote remote learning can be as successful or nearly as successful as face to face classroom. And then as soon as we get the new quit equipment installed, we'll run some training on that new equipment so that everybody's comfortable using that before class begins. So that's what we have planned. We can get some other things together. If you need them, just let me know. Uh, Melanie, a question came up. Um, will this be open to staff adjuncts on July, on the July training? Uh, it could be, yeah, sure. Anyone who's teaching. Yeah, I would say just to get a hold of Melanie and uh, and and uh, if, if that's something that you're interested in, we would encourage that. Um, any other questions, uh, any other insights from cabinet? Um, Josh, anything from an HR standpoint that you want to insert? No, just look for the email later to uh, get all the details we shared about the early retirement program. 
Uh, we want to, uh, uh, again, thanks uh, having uh, Rob Nielsen with us this today. Rob, do you want to give us a sense of where we are on housing? Uh, that is another indicator of enrollment. Housing is looking really good. Uh, most of our, we're projecting a 90 to 95% occupancy. We're, we're getting a lot of uh, applications every day. So things are looking good for housing. And it's same with the food services and meal plan. Just a quick update as well on the uh, on the activity center. Uh, it, it, it will be closed until school starts. They're, they're coming along with the floor and new bleachers and that's moving along. Uh, but we will open the activity center on when school starts, but the the uh, fitness center is open mornings and afternoons if you're wanting to come out and exercise. Terrific. Well, listen, today starts a new fiscal year, July 1st. Um, so uh, we, uh, we're going to try to keep you informed. There are so many that are working behind the scenes to get ready for for uh, for August. And I want to thank them uh, uh, for uh, their very hard work and dedication. Everybody from our custodial staff to our grounds, to our faculty, to our staff, to our, um, especially those that are working hard on advising um, our recruitment uh, uh, staff and our enrollment, uh, our enrollment management uh, uh, staff working very, very hard to, um, uh, to make this uh, a very robust uh, opening in, 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 in August. Um, I want to, uh, our next meeting is scheduled for uh, July 15th at 10 a.m. So um, thank you so much for, for all you do, for being a part of this project of, of uh, developing uh, human well-being and potential. It really is a satisfying and gratifying um, um, thing that we're a part of. And I hope that you can see that uh, we're very lucky to be living where we are. We're very privileged to to be working with uh, the students we do and in the communities we are. And so, uh, let's if we're in a time when there's so much negativity, uh, there's so much uh, that's broken um, uh, politically, nationally, um, and divisiveness in our in our country. Uh, remember though the good. Uh, remember again. Keep in mind the faces and the lives of people that are are coming here to uh, to be to better themselves. Um, focus on your families. Focus on your health. Focus on those things that that you can control. Uh, we will get through this. I promise you. Um, and we don't have all the answers, and we need to make sure that we're we have perspective and humility enough to to admit that. But be nimble enough. We're nimble enough and agile enough that we can make sure that we're we're uh, we're responding to the best information possible. So it's a great honor to work with you all, and to be able to have the staff that uh, that I work with. Uh, it really is a, a daily pleasure to um, to to have you um, uh, lead and and um, um, you know provide uh, your personal efforts. Um, which often comes at a personal sacrifice, and uh, thank you for that. So until we uh, see each other again in a couple of weeks, uh, stay healthy, stay well, uh, stay informed, and let us know how we can help you uh, in your in your work. All the best.